And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who's always thought of himself as a ladies' man. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And it is beautiful here on Milleronia. It's another gorgeous day. Oh, what a good time on Milleronia it is. Uh, Well, the weather's great. Spring training for the Miller League has just started. In Florida, you know, they call it the Grapefruit League. In Arizona, they call it the Cactus League. But here on Milleronia, we call it the Lava League. And every player knows if you don't make the cut, you don't get sent to the miners. You get sent to the volcano. Yes. And not the really, really, really bad one, not the number two volcano, just the number two, the number one volcano, which is Well, pretty bad, because it's, after all, a volcano. But, uh, and uh, we toss you in, and you, well, you know what? You hit that lava, and you'll know you're alive, but not for long. There's no minor league in Milleronia. The players know the minor league is jokingly referred to as Miller's Brimstones. But they like it. They like that it's a little tough here in the Miller League. But it's beautiful, and everyone loves baseball here on Milleronia. And, well, that music just makes me feel so good anyway. You know that by now, but it's the truth. I love our theme song. And that's the Rabbit Kakai Orchestra and the Kimberly Hunt Dancers, featuring boy tenor Mike Lucking asking the musical question, On my last trip to Amazon, I noticed the flight was a little bumpy. Is it possible the pilots had been drinking? Well, first of all, Mike, anything's possible, right? Come on, folks, you know that. Anything's possible. In fact, to be honest, Colonel Jeff read me your musical question, and I didn't even know what it meant. Is that possible, too? Sure. Yes, but Mike, I have a full answer for you. Because we don't fly the planes. I don't, and Colonel Jeff doesn't. Remember, he takes three separate helicopter rides to get here to Milleronia, never mind where it is. But we don't fly the planes, so if someone had been drinking, it wasn't us. And good question, though, a heck of a question. Mike wanted to know on my last trip to Amazon, I noticed the flight was a little bumpy. Is it possible the pilots had been drinking? No, actually. We have the best pilots in the world, and they're really scared now. In fact, they're shaking, because they know that if Well, if they had been drinking, and if I found out about it, and if Mike's question really helped us to open up, you know, a really bad part of the whole Milleronia trip, the pilots know that, well, they would go to the volcano too. And in fact, I would be so mad at that, I think I might make a third volcano. We can find one here, because, you know, this is, remember, I made the whole island. But... We can find a a third volcano, and it would be worse than the second. And the second is worse than the first. What would make the third so bad? Never you mind. It would be way two levels worse than death. Okay? That should should tell you everything you need to know. certainly tells me. And by the way, here's a little uh, note, and we're proud of this, about Rabbit Kakai. He was a great professional surfer, and he was one of the guys, one of the main guys, who brought post-World War II changes to the sport of surfing. Personally, he he taught a lot of the kids surfing, and he got a lot of the, oh, all the, the equipment really made better. He did a great job, and he just passed away at 95. So thank you, Rabbit, for everything. And... If you hadn't passed on, you would have been, well, you would have been coming here to Milleronia. I would have sent one of the helicopters just for you. But I'm glad you were there. And by Amazon. 
and PayPal and my book. Folks, we're proud of our sponsors. Amazon is still the greatest company in the world because remember, they're the only company that does three things no other company does. One, whatever you want, they'll get you. Whatever you order, they'll get you. Whatever you can imagine, they'll get you. Two, they already have it. They don't have to get it. They already have everything. They don't have to make things, get things, have anything shipped in. They have a gigantic warehouse that's filled with all sorts of things. It's one of these really big warehouses that's a mile long and a mile wide and a mile high and a mile low. It's just huge. They already have everything. And number three, folks, they always send us a percentage of whatever you order. And we're very pleased with that because we take that money. Colonel, Colonel Jeff and I take that money that goes right into the box for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. That's right. That's important to us. Last time we went to Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles and we might go there again, but we might do something really fancy. Well, that was fancy, too. Remember, when I say fancy, I don't mean where, you know, the you get up to go to the washroom and you come back and the waiter has refolded your napkin. I don't need that. I don't. After all, I've just been to the washroom. My hands are clean. Clean enough. Clean enough for me. And so, you know what, though? We may get back to some place like... Roscoe's, but remember, they're not a sponsor. They're just a place that does their job so well. They make such good food. I love talking about them. But uh, you know what? We'll we'll get someplace good, and we might, might, might invite Dr. Chris back again to join us. He was with us on the last trip to Roscoe's, and he did a very good job. Remember, he's studying hard at the University of Solvang, on his, well, his clog uh, courses there. He's going to be the greatest clog dancer Southern California has ever seen. And that's a larger group than you might think. So, Dr. Chris, our hats are off to you. And if you're, uh, well, if you're a good boy and you continue to work hard, you just might, might, might get invited out again to our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. And thank you, Amazon. And remember to go to Amazon. You could go on, well, your computer, on your laptop, on your tele, your iPhone. I almost said tele-iPhone. But you know what? You could, but don't do that. Go to our website, and we'll take you there. Our website, remember, is uh, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> With continues to be the worth the worst saxophone note to end any song. Boy, oh boy. That could warn any ship no matter how dark the night is. But you go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com, and we have a banner that says Amazon. You click that and we'll get you there. Doesn't matter when you call. Could be the middle of the night. Could be when we're here on Milleronia or back on the mainland. It doesn't matter. Colonel Jeff and I will both get you to Amazon. And to PayPal. That's right. There's another banner on our website for PayPal. And they're a good group. Boy, they make you feel like you're saving the world. And maybe you are. And uh, PayPal is a chance. You know, if you enjoy my show... And why wouldn't you? And you'd like to send us a few bucks to help out. And why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. And as I love putting it, instead of saying donate or pay what you like or join the Platinum Committee, I, I don't like those things. I like to say buy us some drinks. That's the more neighborly way to do it. Buy us some drinks. Because there are different levels. Levels one through five all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> that group is always in a good mood. We should get them here to Milleronia. You know what? One of these days, folks, one of these days. But you do that. PayPal is a great group to join. 
and it helps you and it helps us. So look for the PayPal banner on our website, which remember, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Oh, I don't know why. I guess I'm trained. I was waiting for the big bad note at the end of that one. (laughs) Boy, that's a big ship. That horn was from a big ship. Sure sure sounds like it, doesn't it? Anyway, folks, uh, go to Amazon and go to PayPal and go to our website. And, by the way, go to get my book. That's right. Signed hardcover copies of my book, Spoiled Rotten America, are now for sale at store.comedyfilmnerds.com. We're very proud of it. I love that book. It did really well when it came out, when it was first published. I'm proud of that. And you know what? I've sent, uh, with Colonel Jeff's help, uh, oh, cartons and cases of the book, signed, and pick up a copy. It's less than it would cost you in the bookstore, and I think you'd love it. I, it's It's really funny, and I loved writing it, and I worked hard on it. So you know what? I think you should read it and work hard on it, too. And you know what? That brings us to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. Still one of my favorite things to do. I love a good joke. You know what? And it's not just because I'm a comedian. I love a good joke. The kind you can pass along, that I can pass along to you, and that you can pass along to your friends and loved ones. And uh, this is a good one this week. Colonel and I both like this one. And uh, and here it goes. I think you'll like it too. There's a young couple about to have their first baby. They are just newly married, less than a year. And, well, she's going to the hospital. He takes her in there. And, boy, oh, boy, everything goes as smoothly as they could want it. They're very blessed. And they... Uh, the doctor, well, the doctor runs everything there, and uh, but the doctor says to them before he takes her into the delivery room, he says to her and the husband, now, listen, I've just invented something, and I want to tell you about this, and I think you should know, you might want to use this, you might want to sign up for it right now. It's a device that cuts the pain for the new mother by a tremendous amount. And, they, well, they're interested in that, they heard that, well, how does it cut the pain? He said, I hook the new mommy up before she gives birth, before she goes into labor. And I hook her up with all these wires and all these graphs and all these screens. And I take the, well, you know, she gets hooked up and her pain goes right to the father. You know, and that's something that, well, the men can help out. And uh, it's going to be a new mother and it's going to be a new father. So you know what? The the father likes to help out and say, let me take, I'm not thrilled about the pain, but yes, let me help my wife with our first baby. And they both look at each other, and the husband and wife, and say, sure, well, sure, you know, let, let's do that. And uh, there she goes into labor, and the doctor just to say, you know what, we'll just use 10%, because I don't want the husband to be overwhelmed by this. He puts it on 10% of the pain. And, well, the woman is in a lot of pain. She's in labor, about to give birth. But 10% of it you know, goes to the father. And, and you know what? And that fellow is standing there, and he's thinking, you know, this isn't so bad. I, I, I'm I, okay. In fact, I, yeah, I hardly feel a thing, you know. So that's, and he says to the doctor, Doc, you know what? Raise it, please. Raise it to 20% because I want to help my wife here. And the doctor does. He raises it up to 20%. And, it cuts into it even more for the wife. And she's feeling better than she would have without it. And and the husband is standing there and he still says to himself, it's, this is okay. I'm all right. And he says to the doctor, doc, 50%, raise it up to 50%. And the doctor says, okay. And the doctor winds it up to 50%. It makes the wife feel so much better. She's really better now. She's calming down and she can just think about giving birth. And, well, the same thing, folks. That husband is standing there and he looks like a young man about to run a race. He looks fine and he is fine. And he says, Doctor, I'm glad you invented this. Please raise it 
to 100%. And the doctor says, you got it. And he raises it up to 100%. The wife is fine. She has a tiny bit of discomfort, but it's almost nothing. And she's really grateful. And the husband, well, he's as fine as he could be. The same thing. And he doesn't feel a thing. And the wife, well, that doctor takes the wife in into the delivery room. She gives birth to a beautiful baby. And the baby's fine. And the mother is fine. And that, well, the guy's standing there. Well, they're just thrilled. They're so happy. And you know what? Everything else goes great. They, they disconnect them from the, the tubes. The, he takes them away from the wife. And folks, that's it. They just had a great baby. And they go home and the, and the doctor shakes hands with everybody. And they put them in the car. And they drive right to their house. They pull in the driveway there. And the first thing they see is the milkman dead on the porch. <laughs> Uh, I hope you like that. We got a kick out of it. That's why, boy, he didn't feel a thing, that husband, did he? Hey, I feel like just another another day walking down Broadway. He's happy as can be. And, well, the reason for that is the father of the baby, which is what the doctor said, well, I guess he felt everything. And it was at a delivery at their house. And he sure didn't get better, did he? He must have exploded like a piñata. Anyway, folks, I hope you like that one. Pass it along if you do. We thought that was very cute here. And that brings to my, se my second favorite part of the show, The Poetry Corner. That must have been the way the milkman was coughing when he got that that first shot of pain there. The one where he first said, Holy mackerel, what in the world is this? In any event, uh, I love the Poetry Corner too, the same way I do the joke of the week because there's nothing greater than a good poem by a great poet. And it really lights up the world for you and me and everyone in it. And also, please pass this along if you like it. It's very nice. It's from uh, written by the great Emily Jane Bronte. She was from the wonderful Bronte family in England, and that included sh sisters Charlotte and Anne, they were such great novelists and writers and poets, and in this case, Emily... And uh, she had a short life, 30 years old, just lived from 1818 to 1848. Her health had been weakened by, get this, folks, unsanitary conditions at her home, the same as her sisters. They lived at a church, and water from the graveyard had poisoned their well. So as much beautiful words as they brought into the world, well, they weren't long for it. And poor Emily passed away at age 30. But you know what? She wrote this, and it's beautiful. It's a poem called, Come, Walk With Me. Come, walk with me. There's only thee to bless my spirit now. We used to love on winter nights to wander through the snow. Can we not woo back old delights? The clouds rush dark and wild. They fleck with shades our mountain heights. The same as long ago, and on the horizon rest at last, in looming masses piled. While moonbeams flash and fly so fast, we scarce can say they smiled. Come, walk with me, come walk with me, we were not once so few, but death has stolen our company as sunshine steals the dew. He took them one by one, and we are left the only two. So closer would my feelings twine 
because they have no stay but thine. Nay, call me not, it may not be, is human love so true? Can friendship's flower droop on for years and then revive anew? No, though the soil be wet with tears, how fair so e'er it grew. The vital sap once perished will never flow again, and surer than that dwelling dread, the narrow dungeon of the dead, time parts the hearts of men. Isn't that lovely? Come Walk With Me by Emily Jane Bronte. Boy, there's just nothing like a great poem that uses our words, all of ours, yours and mine, to make us think as she talks about the nature of love. Can we go back, she says. No, no, you can't go back. You can go on, though, and I'm glad. Thank you, Emily. And that brings us to my third favorite part of the show. M, 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 Triple M, Magic Movie Moment. And just like the other two, I love talking about a magic movie moment. This is, remember, in a movie that maybe you've seen, like me, 10, 20, 30 times, where you just love a movie but there's a part, sometimes just a line, sometimes an entire part of the movie, sometimes the way it's shot, sometimes the script or the acting or the directing, and it just really makes you a smile, and it touches you, it grabs you, it grips you, and it makes the movie so much more special because now, as good as the movie is, it has a magic movie moment. And this one is a favorite of mine. The Wild Bunch, from 1969. What a good movie, directed by Sam Peckinpah. Ah, the great Sam Peckinpah. You have to use that word when describing him. What a storyteller he is. Oh, his works, his movies are so good and so specific and so much a part of his soul. Directed by Sam Peckinpah. And oh, what a cast, starring... William Holden, Ernest Borgnine, Warren Oates, Ben Johnson, Jamie Sanchez, Emilio Hernandez, Edmund O'Brien, Struther Martin, and L.Q. Jones, and so many other. And if you, if you didn't know some of those names, you know Jamie Sanchez and Emilio Hernandez from many other parts, especially working for Sam Peckinpah. This is a great movie. It takes place in 1913, and it's about, well, a wild bunch. Those were the days when it was already into the 20th century, and all of the outlaw gangs who worked so much and stole so much in the late 19th century, well, they were all gone, because our country had changed there, and there was, well, there were no more wild bunches, except this one. William Holden was the was the leader of this one, and they wanted to have, well, just as he says to Ernest Borgnine at one point in a cave there, they're going to sleep, all the whole gang, and says, I just always thought I could, you know, have one more great job, one more, and then, then go back, then go home. And Borgnine, who's so good in this, and Borgnine looks at him and says, home to what? Back? To what? And everyone, including us, knows he's right. And William Holden in the movie, yeah. They both realize they wouldn't change a thing. This is what they do, what they were made to do. And they wouldn't have changed a thing. But the Wild Bunch, oh, the way the story goes, it's so wonderful. And folks, they wind up escaping after a job that doesn't work, and they wind up going to Mexico. And down in Mexico, they go to their, well, to Angel's old town, old village there. And they find out that, well, Angel's father has been killed now by Mapache. 
And he's a really bad bandit leader. He's the great Emilio Hernandez. You've seen him in many things. But boy, these are bad guys. And you know what? They 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 claim they're going down and they run into this gang. The uh, This is a hundred banditos and led by Emilio Hernandez. And you know what? They make a deal because Hernandez is going to kid, he kidnaps Angel as well as the son of the man he already killed. And uh, William Holden and the other fellows make a deal. They'll They'll do a last job. They'll steal a load of guns coming down on a train, and they'll get paid $10,000 for it, and they'll get their colleague, their comrade, their friend, Angel, back again. And then they can move on. And folks, you know what they do that they do their job? They go back to the camp there where the banditos are, and, well, sure enough, the banditos are in the middle of a days-long drunken orgy, just a crazy time there for people like that in 1913. And you know what? Mapache at the time, he doesn't get upset. They're all so drunk, and he says to them, there's no reason for you to be mad. No reason. Here, he gives them some, he gives them some women, and he gives them a, a whole case of whiskey. And he says, go, go, and he gives them... Uh, three cabins to have their fun in, to have their pleasure. And so don't worry about anything. And Angel, poor Angel, has been misused. He's been beaten and tortured in the weeks they were gone. And he's tied up and he's, well, he's in bad, bad shape. And sure enough, the guys do what you think might happen. They, well, they go to those cabins and they say, well, that's the way it goes, and they and they drink, and they have the women, and then William Holden realizes, and he walks out of that cabin, and he realizes this is not the way to live. This is not the way to act when Angel has been tortured, and he's still tied up and bleeding, and he calls his men together. He goes to each cabin, he says, come on. Come on. And uh, everybody comes out. Ernest Borgnine and, and the great Ben Johnson. They're all so good. And Warren Oates comes out. Warren Oates says, for what? And they all feel something's a little off also. And William Holden says to Warren Oates to get Angel. And they know what this means. It means they'll be going up against a hundred banditos. But there are no cowards in that group. And it's a great moment, folks, because William Holden says to get Angel. And then Warren Oates thinks for a second and just says, why not? And it's not a cruel why not. And it's not a, he's, he's really not just settling for anything. He's realized, and they all know, why not? That's what they're there for. That's what they should do. It's a great moment. It's a great truth for Warren Oates and all of them. Let's get Angel. Why not? And they do, and I won't tell you, well, they, they get their guns, and they go right over, back over to the bandits, and to Mapache. And I'm not going to tell you what happens in that scene, but I can tell you, these men, that bunch, that wild bunch, live up to their name. And you're glad as you should be, because, boy, Sam Peckinpah tells us this story so well, and that's the way we want to see them fight and live. William Holden, Ernest Borgnine, Warren Oates, Ben Johnson, Jamie Sanchez, Emilio Hernandez, Edmund O'Brien, Struther Martin. Oh, there's so much good stuff in it. And L.Q. Jones, by the way. If you don't know some of these names, as I said before, you will when you see their faces. Folks, if you've seen The Wild Bunch 30 times, see it again. You'll love it again. And if you've never seen it, 
See It Now, The Wild Bunch from 1969. And you'll feel, well, there's a magic movie moment in all of it. And you know something, though? It reminds me, there are times that are so special that we we don't really think of them as much as we should, and we don't focus on them as much as we should. And what I'm getting at is my younger son is a is going to the prom at his high school. And my wife just told me yesterday, and I said to him, well, how do you like that? He's a, He's a junior now. This is his junior year in high school. But juniors and seniors can go to the prom. So he is. He signed up and he bought tickets and he asked a girl he really likes. And she said yes, and he's taking her to the prom. And he rented a tux. And you know what? My wife and I are really proud of him. We thought that's so sweet. He should be going to the prom. Oh, that word, prom. Well, maybe there are some good memories and maybe there's some bad for you and me. But he should go. He's going to borrow my car and pick her up and drive them both wherever they have to go. And it reminded me, though, because that's wonderful. I'm going to sit him down. I'm going to talk to him and I'm going to say, you know, hey, if there's anything you want, you want anything to know, if you have anything you want to ask, ask me. If you have any questions you have about behavior or what it's nice to do or or the things you should do or shouldn't do. And I'm going to do that maybe tonight. And uh, it reminded me, folks, I went to my high school prom too. Now, I rented a white double-breasted Edwardian tux with black buttons and a fluffy colored formal shirt and a large silk black clip-on bow tie. Is that hot enough for you? And you know what? That's what I wanted at that time. Well, I was I was 17, and that's what I wanted. I remember I had that in my head. Boy, I, I think this is what folks are wearing, but I know that they, they, these were out there. And that's what I wanted to wear. And that's what I did wear. And I borrowed my folks' car, too. And uh, just like my son will do, and they, my folks' car was a... Uh, Two-door, yellow, white vinyl roof, Buick Century. And I invited a girl I had a crush on, too. She was very nice and said yes, and we got along really well. But uh, she didn't be seem to be interested in making out with me, which is fine. Hey, I'm not the whole wrestling team. I'm just being silly. You know what? That I'm kidding. I, I drove her home and... And uh, I really liked being with her. And we were together at the prom. And I didn't so happen. So I, I didn't know anything about girls in those days. And I barely know anything now. And I've got kids. Shouldn't I know something? And, but uh, you know what? I didn't find out anything about women. I didn't do anything fancy, wink, wink, with a woman till my junior year in college when a really pretty girl from Smith in my fraternity bar came over and said hello. And, well, folks, that was three, four years later, and I am here to tell you that if I knew nothing my senior year in high school, I knew a lot less than nothing in my junior year in college. And... That was fine with me, though. I never felt bad about any of this. I never felt bad that I wasn't scoring. I didn't even know what scoring was. I really, I enjoyed knowing nothing. Does that make sense? I was at a good school and a, a nice fraternity. I liked them both very much. And, uh, you know, I just thought, well, maybe it's not, it's not my time yet to know all the dramatic, intimate things about women. I was, uh, at that point, I was enjoying being with my friends in my fraternity. And uh, then th this really pretty girl in the official uniform that made a woman pretty to me, she had painter's pants and topsiders and a tucked-in Brooks Brothers shirt. And folks, for good or ill, 
That was fine with me. There was no test to pass, but if there was, that was it, and she passed. But she was very pretty and very nice, and uh, she came up to me in our fraternity bar downstairs. We always had a keg of beer tapped, and we always had it, well, at our little fraternity bar. It wasn't so little, actually. It was about regular bar size. And we always had a keg on because, well, I was the social chairman. So if there ever needed to be a keg on, they could come to me and say, Hey, Larry, why don't we put a keg on? And I could always say, there was no, there's no argument with me there. I, I always said, sure. Yeah, and so we did. We went and got one. And this, uh, this young woman came up to me in the fraternity bar, and we were talking. We talked for five, six, seven minutes, maybe ten minutes. And for me, this was really something. I... Remember, I still didn't know anything at all about women or what to do with women or what you do, what you say, how you how you act. And uh, she, but she, she seemed very nice. And she said to me, uh, so uh, do you live here in the fraternity? And I said, yeah, right upstairs. And I didn't even notice that was the answer she was looking for. And that uh, she uh, said to me and but I didn't know how to push the deal. I mean, I didn't. Need, so I said, yeah, right upstairs. She's just asked me, do you live here? Yeah, right upstairs. That was the answer she wanted. And I just went back to talking to her downstairs in the fraternity bar. And after the five minutes of whatever in the world it was we were talking about, there was a pause of about 10 seconds. And she said to me, so you live right upstairs. Here in the fraternity, she just repeated that. And I said, yeah, right up there, right up the stairs. And she said to me, there was nothing, I didn't follow it up with anything. So now with an, after another pause, she said, may we go up there? Can I see it? Can you show me your room? And I said, sure. Again, I said, wow, this is great. I didn't know how to sell anything. So we start walking up the back staircase that left. It uh, started right in the fraternity bar, off on the side next to the jukebox, and wound up, and uh, we walked. I had a great room. I lived there two years in this fraternity, and I liked it a lot. It was just one there, one person in it. That was me, and this was, wow, these were all beautiful old Georgian family uh, houses, but big. These fraternities were big, and I guess regular fraternity size and nice buildings. And uh, mine was on the first floor there, 16-foot ceiling it had. That's pretty high. And a working fireplace and its own bathroom. And uh, it wasn't fancy. In fact, I didn't use that bathroom. In fact, uh, even as a young single guy, I didn't think it was a good idea to unzip anything in that bathroom. But uh, it was a terrific room. And we walked in there, and it's, well, it's kind of impressive a little bit. I had 16-foot ceilings and big. It was a big room. And uh, so we sat down. I put I had two chairs that I had gotten in a garage sale. And they are pretty good chairs. And uh, so I sat her down in one, and I sat myself down in the other one. Remember, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no clue. So I sit her in a chair, and I sit in the other chair about eight feet away. And we start talking again. And this poor young woman, poor thing, was, she, you know, she didn't know why I wasn't doing more, making a move, doing something. And I uh, and I said at that point, I said, hey, uh, how about if I build a fire? The fireplace works. And I I had never built a fire. I didn't know anything about fires. But I found wood all over the campus, just wood, shelving, and but just boards of wood which is not what you do. I'm sure you know, you get little logs. You get logs for a fire. But I didn't. I just got a bunch of, well, one by six and one by eight and one by ten wood. And I brought it back to my room and I sawed them into roughly log-sized pieces, but only roughly. So I built a fire, built in quotes. I put about eight pieces of this wood in the fireplace on the grating, and then I just squatted down and lit a match and held it under the corner of one of the pieces of wood. 
Now, I'm I'm guessing you know Martians would know this. Yeah, that's not how you light a, fi- a fire. So I would held the match under the corner of one of the pieces of wood. It didn't light, of course. And then when the match burned down, it, ooh, it hurt. I, I put throw it out. And then I lit another four or five matches. And, of course, they do nothing. And it's the same thing. I held it on the same corner of the wood. You know, after all four matches, it it might have turned a tiny bit black. But just that, but it wasn't going to go on fire. It wasn't going to light. And I said to uh, this girl, I said, st- I stood up there and kind of slapped my hands off to get the dust off, did that. <laughs> and I said to her, uh, well, I don't think this is working, so we may have to forget the fire. Now, she was okay with that. She still didn't know why I was doing any of this. And I sat back down in my chair. Now, this was, as I said, a big room, but there was no bed in it. I had built with uh, the first year I had a roommate there, and we built a loft. And it was, because remember, 16-foot ceilings, we could be, we did, we could build a loft 12 feet high with four by four beams, just four of them, you know. It wasn't so well built, but it was built enough. And so f- four four by four beams, and then a well, a, you know, a, a, a platform on top of the four by four beams, made out of more wood, but just wood, one by eight boards of wood. And then on top of that was a mattress, a single mattress. And so at one point, this girl says to me, uh, you know, uh, so where's your bed? Do you have a bed? The poor thing is just trying to move this along. She came here to the fraternity and she wanted to meet a guy. And she liked me and that's wonderful. I'm glad she did. And I gave the answers to the right questions of, do you stay, do you live here at the fraternity? Right upstairs. And that was fine with her. If if she if she had picked a guy who knew anything more. So she says at this point, after the fire doesn't work, she I sit back down in the other chair and she says, uh, so where's your bed? I don't see a bed. Where do you sleep? And I said, oh, right up there on top of the loft. I built that loft. And uh, plus, that by the way, I had put up two sort of, uh, well, little sort of hippie-ish uh, curtains with drawings on them of something or other. And they were very light, very filmy. So I just hung up one on one side and one on the other. And I said, it's right up there. And she said, oh, no, another 10 seconds goes by. And now she's her voice is starting to get edgier. Now she says, may I see it? She's really thinking. She's glancing at her watch saying, let's go, buddy. Come on. Let's get this going. Now, she knew what this was, but I, I, I didn't. So I said, oh, sure, okay, may I see it? Okay, sure. <laughs> now I, so there was a ladder portion that I had built, and I said, just head up there, one foot, you know, just climb right up. And then I said to her, now, careful when you get up there, because there are no handrails. There's nothing to hold by hand. So just just lean forward a little, and that'll carry you right onto the platform. And then, and then there's about a foot and a half there, and then right onto the bed. And she did that. She was fine with this. This was no problem for her. And she did that. And then I climbed, I climbed up too. And I did the same thing. And I got onto the mattress too. And we're lying on the mattress, both facing each other, just about a foot apart, which is kind of close. And folks, I was thrilled. I had never done anything intimate with a woman. And I, I didn't know anything about how to do anything intimate with a woman. I had a a vague technological sense that something was supposed to go somewhere. And that was, again, fine with me. That was the way I was. And so we're lying, both lying on the mattress there, and I'm just thinking what I think a lot of knuckleheads like me think, which is, oh, if I know, if I only knew the thing you say now, you know, that there's something to say, that there's a line of something doesn't have to be funny, but something that you say to which the, the woman then says, oh, yes, as if she's waiting for you to say that. Of course, that's just idiotic. There's nothing to say. We're already in the bed together. And 
after a failed fire. But, I mean, we're in the room, in the bed. And I think there's something to say still. There's nothing to say. It's been said. Whatever needs to have been said. But she, so she was, it was all in her hands, so to speak. And she, so she reached out and kind of, you know, mis, you know, ran her hand down my face and hair. And, well, that was, again, I almost flipped out. I, this was amazing to me. I had never had this kind of contact. And, but I didn't move because I didn't know how to move. I didn't know how to get closer. So she did, though. She got a little closer. She kind of, sh you know, shook herself a little over, about another six inches or so closer to me. And then when I still didn't move, I, I looked happy because I was. But when I still didn't move, she pulled with her hand now over the uh, the, the back of my head. And uh, <laughs> she pulled and and she kissed me. And I thought that was the greatest thing that ever happened. <laughs> that was the perfect line for me to walk in on. <laughs> That's right. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, honey. That was my wife who just came to get her car phone. She doesn't need to hear this story because that's why she was laughing. God bless her. She's great. But uh, she doesn't need to hear that I didn't know what I was doing. She already knows I don't know what I'm doing. But uh, this, this young woman did. She pulled my head in and she kissed me. And folks, I was, again, I, ne I nearly fainted. I was so, I didn't really know much about kissing or anything. And uh, she did that. She kisses me. And then we break the kiss, you know, and now I'm just smiling at her. And the poor thing is, is is wondering, what do I have to do with this guy? Doesn't he know the rules of the fraternity, for goodness sake? And no, I didn't. And after another 10 seconds now, we're not kissing. We've kissed. And then now I say to her, well, I guess we better go back downstairs again. I, I didn't know what to do. That was the only thing I could think of to say. And at that point, that was, she was ready to hear it because she could tell. Poor thing. Nothing seems to be happening here. I got the one guy who knows less than most guys. Or maybe all guys. I don't know. Maybe 80% of guys. But you know something, folks? I did. And uh, so she started to say, well, I'm going to get back down. And she did. She started to climb down facing me, you know, back down the that ladder again and i i should have said you know she was looking at me kind of annoyed but she should be at that point and she she was i didn't remember to say hey watch out because there are no hand holds there to tell her again you know to watch out and she oh boy it was uh, well she fell off she had climbed down a couple of steps and as she got down on the third step or so she realized you naturally start to, well, lean back a little, but she realized there's nothing to hold. There's nothing to grab. There's no safety. So she, so suddenly the annoyed expression went to kind of a whoa, 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 whoa expression. And she fell off. She fell backwards onto a plexiglass table I had that I'd gotten at another garage sale. And there was a statue of Don Quixote on it that I'd gotten at another garage sale, which was, this was, well, this was uh, made of metal about two feet high, and he's holding a spear, which is about two feet higher than he was. But it's a spear sticking up. It's a death spear. And this young woman fell backwards. Thank God she didn't land on it. Well, she kind of did, but not on it to where there was going to be, well, you know, a horrible, you know, accident. But she landed on the on the plexiglass table, and I could just hear one thud, and her and her going, oh, well, the poor thing, she's just fallen nine or ten feet onto a plexiglass table from a garage sale, and I climbed down myself. I was pretty good at that at this point, and I went over to her. I said, oh, are you all right? And I I, I helped her up. Thank God she was fine. I mean she. A little dizzy now and scared, and nothing that she wanted had happened, and so I I kind of helped straighten her out, 
the Brooks Brothers shirt and the painter's pants. And uh, so we went back down to the bar, to the fraternity bar. And I was, I said, can I get you one? And uh, I was just puzzled at that point. <laughs> that Her answer was, no. <laughs> it wasn't that mean, but it was, she was wondering. I know on the bus home, because well, there was a five college bus service at that point in that area to Smith and Mount Holyoke and Amherst where I was. And boy, they, <laughs> I know on the bus when her friends said to her, so how'd it go with that guy? And I know her answer was going to be, I don't even know what to tell you. There's just, are they all this dumb? They don't know anything. And I'm sure, by the way, most women as adults and even as students would say to each other, yeah, they, they kind of don't. They kind of don't know what they're doing. Even the ones who know what they're doing don't really know what they're doing. Now, maybe you're a guy who's listening out there, and maybe you're thinking that, uh, well, I knew what I was doing. Well, I'm all right. God bless you. I'm glad. But even those who knew what they're doing don't really know. You know, f folks, the takeaway from this story is we don't necessarily know what we're doing. Women, too, but especially men at that age. You know, grown-up boys don't really know that much. You know, and folks, in this in those days, you know, when you're when you're with something, if you're a guy and you're with someone, and you think, well, she must know what she's doing, and she doesn't. This young woman didn't know what she was doing either. She knew more than I did, but I knew nothing. And if you're a woman, and uh, you're with a guy you might like, well, and she, you know, you're she's looking at you thinking. Well, he must know what he's doing, and you don't. You don't know what she's, you're doing. She doesn't know what she's doing. You're in college together, and your parents, even without knowing what you're doing, probably looking at each other just going, they don't know what they're doing. And you know what? Even when guys know what they're doing, they don't. Remember, no one knows what we're doing. No one. And that's a good lesson. It's not a bad lesson. I didn't care. Remember, I wasn't I wasn't that annoyed by this. I wasn't annoyed at all. I just kept thinking, and it wasn't the only time, well, this may not be the right time for me to be a ladies' man. And I loved being with my friends. I loved being in that fraternity. I loved being at that college. And that was the right time for that. That was not only fine for me, that was plenty for me. And, uh... You know, sure, it would take years to develop the astonishing knowledge I have now <laughs> in the world of women, which is not true. You never know. You never know anything. And that's a good way to be. You know what? You and I know a lot of the same things, and we're happy with that. Homer is Homer, and Pluto is a planet. And remember, folks, as always... If you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. And that's the truth. It was true when I was 19 and it's true today. Be well and we'll see you here next time.